Hello, I'm Tian Wei, and welcome to Dynamics of Connectivity, a special episode focusing on China's one country, two systems policy and its impact today. This episode is part of the Global Thinker special on CGTN. It's been over two decades after Hong Kong and Macau returned to the motherland from colonial rules. That has turned one country, two systems from a governance concept into vivid reality. But the process was not without challenges, financial crisis, pandemics, and political turmoil even. Now, the emphasis is much more on how to breathe vitality into the special administrative regions of Hong Kong and Macau. So they will shine and thrive together with the rest of the China in the world. I'm honored to be joined today by a very strong panel. Martin Jacques, who is a historian and writer, former senior fellow from the University of Cambridge. Good to see you, Martin. Norman Shi, vice chair of Deloitte China and an honorary university fellowship from the University of Hong Kong. Mr. Shi, good to see you. And Agnes Lan Fong, who is the Macau Legislator Director for the Center of Macau Studies with the University of Macau, and Professor Whitman Han from the 13th National People's Congress. Actually, he's the Hong Kong deputy of that Congress. Thank you, Professor. Last but not least, Edward Xie, Chairman and CEO of Gaofeng Advisory Company. Edward, how are you? I'm fine, thank you, Tian Wei. Thank you so much for all your participation. Ladies and gentlemen, if I ask you as the resident in Hong Kong, what is your takeaway of what happened over the past few years, especially how Hong Kong survived and now be able to stretch its wings? Shall I go to you first, Norman? Up and down, I would say down and up. Because um, initially, in the in the in the first twenty five years, I would say that um, certainly that uh, we have um, sort of the you just mentioned about turmoil, so psychological and also economic side, we do not feel that um, it's very um, sort of confidence to move forward. You know, everything is like a stabilized, but at the same time, um, we do not see that there's a move over the confidence levels. And uh, after the the or the international lies um, the. Uh, 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 security laws. I think that's something which we see that much easier stabilize the uh, political side, and uh, we now start to see the light of the future. That is coming from a businessman in Hong Kong. What about for you, Professor Han? Um, if you look at the one country, two systems as a, a model, it has been proven in the past 25 years. You know, we, we have obviously uh, coming back to the motherland, so it's one country and the two systems been working well. Um, Economic-wise, there has been a moderate growth over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, there have been challenges, there have been turmoils, but uh, since the introduction of the national security law, as well as the new electoral system, I think Hong Kong has now stabilized. We need to look into is under one country, two systems. Within Hong Kong, what kind of capitalist system we should use? You know, okay. How do we benefit the people of Hong Kong? under the one country, two systems going forward. Mr. Xie, I wonder what is the question from you and what is your takeaway of the past few years? I think in the last several years, uh, Hong Kong has undergone a very tumultuous time. As you know, firstly, with the uh, social unrest and then with the pandemic, which have uh, you know, taken a lot of toll from Hong Kong. But I think uh, a number of things have drastically changed Hong Kong uh, during this time. One is the national security law. The other is the election reform. And I believe the most fundamental change in Hong Kong is the general public's recognition that we are no longer just working on the two system principle. Yeah. The one country is as important and probably even more important. And, and that recognition is, uh, I would say the first time that's happening in Hong Kong. So I would say that would be the biggest change. Mm. Of course, it's not just Hong Kong, it's also the Macau Special Administrative Region. On that, I would love to go to you, Agnes. Tell me more about how you reflect upon the past 10 years. So as you just mentioned, Macau and Macau is also, it is the, the, the second place that we also implement one country and two system. So I think that uh, when we're talking one country and two system, we, we have no question about one, one country. But when we're talk, talking about the two systems, 
two systems, we are talking about that how to make these two systems mm. integrate together smoothly. Hong Kong is a much more mature uh, market economy than Macau. And so then it, 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 it is so mature that uh, I think that it has its own engine and it would be harder for Hong Kong uh, to integrate with the two systems. It seems that everybody agree that over the past few years, things are not without challenges. However, looking forward, seems that many possibilities could come true. Now, I would love to have Martin also to comment on that. Before it, let's take a look at this background so that we put more perspectives into our thinking. Take a look. So that is some of the key moments of Hong Kong and Macau over the past decades. Martin, you've been a very close and passionate observer, shall I say, of these two special administrative regions and of one country, two systems. What is your takeaway looking at this? Well, I think it's proved much more difficult than was originally anticipated. Uh, I think this has been a very difficult period, actually, for Hong Kong. Uh, the transition from being a colony to a, a new relationship with China um, has been a, a, a pretty tortuous path, I think. Um, and one of the biggest difficulties has been getting the Hong Kong people on side for what are, let's face it, very big changes, not just economic changes, but not least cultural changes of attitude and so on. And now I, I'm quite optimistic that we've arrived at a new point for Hong Kong, where on the basis of a new kind of political consensus and a recognition that the key question is the relationship with China, that one country, two systems are not equivalent, that actually one country comes first and two systems is it within that context. I think there's been a lot of ambiguity and confusion about that, but now I think there is a new clarity. I would love to quote from Chinese President Xi Jinping in a recent speech he delivered right on the occasion of the 25th anniversary of Hong Kong's return to China. He said this, quote, Hong Kong is backed by the motherland and connected to the world. This is Hong Kong's unique and significant advantage. Hong Kong residents cherish it, and the central government also cherishes it. The central government fully supports Hong Kong's long-term maintenance of its unique position and advantages, end of quote. Now, you see in that advantages, connectivity, Hong Kong's past and future are very much connected. Professor Hong, to you, yes. how do you see you know, connectivity could be implemented in Hong Kong to be able to maintain that charm and even strengthen that charm after all of this. Thank you. Uh, actually, I was in the audience when President Xi made his speech. Great uh, to hear. I think, yes, uh, connectivity has always been there. I mean, that is the um, key, one of the key value Hong Kong provides as the connect super connector between um, China and the world. Like a receiver and transmitter, you know, some things mm -hmm. can change a little bit. For example, the financial, uh, as a financial center. Uh, right now, um, there's a lot of uh, uh, Chinese, mainland Chinese companies uh, in the America stock exchange are facing challenges. You know, some of them are slowly moving out of that exchange. Some of them may end up landing in Hong Kong. 
But when they land in Hong Kong, unlike when you land back to, for example, Shanghai or Shenzhen, in Hong Kong, we have the international investment community, international money here. Mm -hmm. So um, putting those, uh, is Hong Kong will still play that kind of a key role as the con connectivity and the connector between China and the world. And the same with things like information, data security, yeah. and also as a way to attract and uh, work with international talents. Yeah, and some of the areas you mentioned certainly crucial. For example, be a even a talent hub for both the rest of the China and the region. But there are other issues, you know, how to make sure it could happen. So, uh, Mr. Xie, I would love to pick your wisdom as well at this moment as part of the uh, business community about this. I say at the very you know, initial phase of the, uh, of the handover, uh, for, for over a decade, actually, Hong Kong administration was trying to do a lot of things by themselves, even though it's already working under the so-called one, one country, two system uh, principle. Uh, but I think over time, a couple of things have happened. One is that uh, you know China has become more and more powerful, and it's become a real economic power, and its influence into the rest of the world has become very, very significant. And therefore, Hong Kong's role has also evolved and uh, also continues to be very important. Mm. In this context, um, the one country part of the one country, two system becomes even more prominent because as China grows and as China's impact for the rest of the world increases, mm. Hong Kong's role within China's own planning becomes more important. In other words, connectivity it, it is about aligning to a large extent Hong Kong's own planning with the China's overall plan, but not exactly the same. Mm -hmm. it, has going to, it has to be some division of labor, but at the same time, the overall directions got to be fairly well aligned. Great points there. And we certainly see when it comes to aligning the interests of Hong Kong with the rest of the China and with the rest of the region and make sure the advantages are being met to the largest extent. That is really crucial. On that point, I have to say, uh, the previous two special administrative region chief executives of Hong Kong did concur. Let's play short quotes from them. First of all, Mr. Lang Zhenying. The election committee in the design of political structure in Hong Kong is very much the, the center of the um, formation or the creation of the um, uh, political structure. Under the national security law, we have now seen stability. We have now seen Hong Kong people recovering that freedom to speak their mind, but at the same time upholding human rights and freedoms and all those uh, business-friendly environment that Hong Kong used to have. And on top of that, we have the support of the People's Republic um, of China and also the very favorable policies provided by the central government. So you can see that uh, both from the governance level to the business community, to the academics and to the Hong Kong society, there are increasing consensus. But consensus is one thing. How to make sure all the hot buttons, in a way, are going to be tapped into. Hong Kong needs to think in new ways. And one of the great difficulties, I think, after 1970, is though, although in some ways it did, in many ways it didn't. It never tackled the colonial legacy of, internally. And attitudes in, China, in Hong Kong, in a way, still uh, continued uh, from the previous pe period amongst the people. What I think uh, Hong Kong is confronted with is, first of all, a quite different relationship with China. I mean, there've been great reluctance on, in all sorts of ways on the part of Hong Kong to be part of China, to integrate, to cooperate with Southern China, with Guangdong and so on. That has to end. The Greater Bay Area, Hong Kong must be an integral part of this. Mm. And th th that seems to me crucial to the way forward. Secondly, uh, Hong Kong needs to think of itself in a new way. I mean. One of the difficulties, let's be honest about this, is a lot of Hong Kong people look down on mainlanders. This is a deep historical problem and cultural problem in Hong Kong. And it has to change. There has to be a big cultural shift. You can't just legislate for that. You've got to win people to the idea that 
China is the future. China is Hong Kong's future. And it's in that context that Hong Kong's future lies. Crucial point you made there, which is whether perceptions have already caught up with the realities. And in order to make future happens, whether perceptions are now in line with the future. I think that is very crucial. So on that, let me go to you, Edward, also about it. I agree with Martin. Many of the Hong Kong people's perception of meaning is a very different, it's a very different notion. Uh, it, it's not entirely uh, appropriate. And so, you know, reorienting this perception back to its normality is a critical task. And that has to go with education. It has to go with uh, communications. And of course, it has to go with the leadership. But, you know, Norman, how would people in Hong Kong, you know, business community, you know, just the average Joe walking on the street, be able to understand the real essence, the real nature? It seems that um, our business community are really understand about the China, uh, especially about the mainland China, what they're going to do. But at the same time, we seem to ignore the most of the people in Hong Kong. Okay, so there's a, this, the a gap between the business community, a bit the most of the Hong Kong people, about mm -hmm. mostly young people. So this is connection is also important to connect the business side, the society side, and the government side, mm -hmm. and also our Chinese governments together, and make you sure that the integration part of the world and we make a good part of the, the whole country. Whitman, Norman said you have a lot of work to do. I think the most important thing is really uh, media and education, okay? These two, are, um, they're related as well. Uh, I myself, I have another role, which is I represent the zone of Shanghai in Hong Kong as their chief rep. And ever since 2015, we have been arranging university students to have internships in mm. Shanghai. Um, during summer. Well, didn't have that last year because of pandemic and the previous year because of riot. But before that, every young people, every young person who had experienced that one month, they have totally changed their perspective. Okay, they, they work and live with their counterparts, young mm. people in Shenzhen. Uh, they have more similarities than they, they have with me, right? So <laughs> it's very easy for them to, you know, go to karaoke and, and barbecue together. And after a while, you know, they can re really feel, oh, people in Shenzhen are no different from us. You know, they, uh -huh. they, they the same music, they love the same food, and they work uh, even harder than us. So I would suggest that some of the, uh, they can have like some of the students uh, in Hong Kong, they can move up to the, the other campus for one semester, for example. And, and did exchange, they, okay. Did they invite you when they have uh, barbecue parties? No, they don't. I'm too old. <laughs> I'm too old. <laughs> you are too old. <laughs> I guess uh, they, their generation have a lot to say and also to work together for, right? Um, good, yes. for, good luck to them, certainly. But good news for the students, if they got time and <laughs> opportunity to travel both sides, it goes both ways, in fact. Uh, but, you know, besides that, uh, one of the things is very crucial, that we need to look at the reality. The reality actually already shines. If you look at the number, you know, about how the mainland has been working with Hong Kong and Macau over the past decades, some of the key numbers certainly showed it. During the past few years, we've noticed some different changes between the Chinese mainland and Hong Kong. 1997, the territory accounted for 18% of China's overall economy. That figure is 2% today. And the number of Chinese companies, I mean the companies based on the mainland, listed in Hong Kong has jumped from 101 from the very beginning to 1,370, and the number is going up making up about 78% of Hong Kong stock market's capitalization. Hong Kong was the Asian headquarters of 252 Chinese companies and 254 American businesses last year. All these numbers show what you are trying to say. The reality is already promising, and the perceptions need to catch up with the realities. Uh, on that point, Martin, how much can we expect the business community to help? Well, I think that we, we, your figures are, of course, very interesting, and uh, they are a very important trend, a very important new reality. So what do, we, what do they tell us? They tell us that Hong Kong, as an international financial center, has become 
also much increasingly uh, sinicized, if you like. In mm -hmm. other words, the presence of China in uh, Hong Kong, financially and in business terms, has become and will become much more important. And that redefines the position of Hong Kong. It's no longer a kind of uh, Western orientated, if you like, free floating uh, territory, uh, uh, you know, off China, um, as let's say it was in the 80s and 90s. And it's now increasingly uh, closely related to China, but with still very important links to, to elsewhere in the world, mm. including the West. Uh, another thing I would add to that, Jan Wen, it, it, is that um, Hong Kong needs to feel sort of comfortable about itself. And I don't think it does yet feel comfortable about itself because it's been, this, Hong Kong has been filled with inertia. We think of Hong Kong as being very dynamic, but I don't think of it really in that way. I did once, but I don't really think it is because it's found it, it's found it very difficult to think differently. And it needs to think differently because the world around it has changed so mm -hmm. profoundly, especially in China. So, you know, a lot of Hong Kongers, they think westwards, they never thought northwards. But these things are not easy to, they, yeah. look, they, they, take, they have a pace of their own. These are cultural changes. These are attitudinal changes. There are generational changes. So you can't sort of, you know, legislate for different attitudes. That has to be lived by people and people have to be persuaded uh, along those lines. Okay. I mean, let me just say one thing in this context because we haven't mentioned it. And that is what really hit me when I first started going to Hong Kong uh, in the in the uh, uh, in the mid nineties, was what a colonial place it was. I, I was a British people at person. I was going to Hong Kong, and I really disliked it. I really disliked this part of Hong Kong. My wife was uh, Indian Malaysian. She was treated very badly by a lot of the Chinese because of her color. So, and these were all in many ways a legacy of British colonialism. And so you, you're, we're looking here for a big cultural shift. And you know, we, I know we're going maybe discuss this later, but one of the problems I had in Hong Kong when my friends came, because we lived there for a while, was coming from the West, was to show them something Chinese. Actually, that was very difficult in Hong Kong because 156 years of British colonialism had deprived, in many ways, the Hong Kong population of their Chinese heritage. Mm. And so there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of things that need changing, which can't all be changed overnight. But if we know the light, if we know the direction that Hong Kong needs to be moving, this can be done, this can be achieved, but it takes time. Great points there. You're watching Dynamics of Connectivity, a special episode of Global Thinkers of CGTN with a focus on one country, two systems. We'll be back after this. You're watching Dynamics of Connectivity, a special episode of Global Thinkers of CGT and focusing on one country, two systems. Let me move on now to a very important point about perception and cultures. If I could, ladies and gentlemen, to invite you on a visit with me to Hong Kong on this big screen. On a visit to Hong Kong, there's a place now that you must see, the West Kowloon Cultural District. In fact, in front of us on the big screen, a photo of a great work, White Glazed Baby Pillow. It is made by the Ding Qiun, one of the five most well-known kilns of the Song Dynasty in China. Now it is on exhibition at the Hong Kong Palace Museum. It is a precious item. The baby's pillow, one of the favorites 
of Emperor Qianlong from the Qing Dynasty about 300 years ago. He is quite a connoisseur, so you will see this is a precious item. At the beginning of July this year, the Hong Kong Palace Museum officially opened to the general public. For the very first time in history, people in Hong Kong can enjoy tangible link with traditional Chinese culture. The next one is a painting. It is the well-known masterpiece, Luo Shen Fu Tu. The original work is made by Gu Kaiji, one of the most well-known and respected traditional Chinese painters in Jin Dynasty. The painting depicts the meeting between a young man and the goddess of Luo Shen at the Luo Shui River, vividly capturing the mood of their first meeting and eventual separation. It is also listed as a national treasure together with the baby's pillow, the first photo we saw earlier. The Hong Kong Palace Museum was officially opened to the public in July, displaying more than 900 precious cultural relics selected from over the Palace Museum in Beijing. They are just amazing. But you know, this is not the whole idea. The idea is, how is Hong Kong and people there, and also who are visiting Hong Kong, be able to understand better about Chinese culture? Agnes, I want to pose that question to you. I wonder whether you and the other guests have visited the Hong Kong Palace Museum. I haven't uh, visited uh, the Hong Kong, uh, Beijing, Paris physically yet because the border is still closed. I, I couldn't go, mm -hmm. uh, but I can kind of I watched an online video about that when it was open, uh, 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 you know, some time ago. And also, I, of course, I visited the Beijing, Paris uh, in person uh, many times. I mean, when you were walking in the Palace Museum in Beijing with uh, history of several dynasties right in front of you, as a Chinese? Of course, I feel we're proud of it. And at the same time, I feel like I own the Chinese uh, history by myself, in a way, uh, because we all learn about those uh, history from the books and also from the uh, TV series as well, <laughs> and from novels, right? Mm. And so when, I, when, I, when I'm when standing in front of that, I would think of, you know, different emperors, you know, their you know, juicy mm. stories. And at the same time, I would kind of um, I feel that, okay, uh, that part of me or, or that part of Chinese is in line with... Uh, so it's like, I'm part of that. And that is yeah, part yeah, of me, part of right? That, and and it's, it's also part of me. Uh, Norman, Edward, and also Whitman. Have you guys visited the uh, Hong Kong Palace Museum? What was it like to be there in the middle of history? Edward. Yeah, I, I was there. Uh, I was also in the, the Beijing uh, Palace Museum as well. Uh, of course, the collection collections in Hong Kong was much smaller compared to the collections in Beijing, by definition. But I think for many Hong Kong people, uh, this is a uh, part, a kind of a relearning yeah. about China. Because for a long time, many Hong Kong people know that we are Chinese, but at heart, they're really not that Chinese. And, and to Martin's point earlier, it was largely because of the colonial education. And so we became very awkward and very unique. But now I think we now have a chance to really learn about our civilization and our culture. And the fact that we have a 5,000 years civilization, the only continuously documented history in the world, we should feel proud about. Norman. I think this is so important. This is not a collectivity about the, between the Western culture or, or, or Chinese culture, but more important, this is play for education for, for our young people in Hong Kong. And this is so important to, uh, just like I just mentioned, so to help us to understand about the Chinese history, about how the civilized of, of our countries, and also how to make our people, our young, especially young people, be proud of that. Whitman. Yeah. Uh... I actually attended the opening ceremony of the Palace Museum in Hong Kong, but I didn't go through a floral visit. You know, it was just <laughs> a very short one. Uh. This uh, Hong Kong Palace Museum, it looked like, to me, it's like a, you know, a teaser, a Western, uh, you know, a, a teaser to the Western world of what the real Chinese uh, Palace Museum and its culture is, okay? It's a smaller collection, 
Uh, it kind of changes over months, uh, but it gives you some of the best ones they have, but then it's just a beginning, okay? Mm -hmm. To really, uh, you still have to visit the one in Beijing because that one is much, much bigger. But what is important though, if you just measure West Kowloon, it's just opposite of the Palace Museum, it's the M plus. Yes. Okay, that is a museum of contemporary arts, westernized way of displaying, not, not just Western culture, but some local and, and mainland Chinese as well, but it's contemporary art. Okay, so here we have, within walking distance, two large museums uh, in the center of the city, where you have the Chinese culture and art, and then you have the contemporary, more westernized culture. So it you're saying different. Western Kowloon district is mainly a place where the East meets the West culturally. Exactly, and then that is the one of the new position for Hong Kong, which is the interchange for Hong Kong, uh, Western and Chinese culture. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's one of the position uh, that's given to us uh, in the 14th five years plan, that Hong Kong should become uh, a uh, you know, Western and Chinese culture and art interchange. I think all of you are making a great point, that is the comprehensive identities of Hong Kong, not only as a financial hub, not only connecting to the Greater Bay Area, but also be able to show its charm culturally and also be inclusive as uh, it grows and it develops. On that, I would love to tap into the wisdom of Martin. Well, I think that uh, the world really is on uh, a path of discovery um, about China. I like that, path of discovery. China was regarded as an economic phenomenon, you know, the rise of China as an economic entity. Uh, it wasn't seen in broader political or cultural terms. That took a bit longer. But I think there's been a big revival uh, of, of interest in China uh, over the last uh, 20 years or so, across the world, actually, as people have wanted to find out about China because China is so important and will get more important for the world. And it is so rich, so fascinating, and so different to Western mm -hmm. history and culture. That, that's what I love about it. I mean, it's just one of the things I love about it is it just has a different logic, a different way of seeing, yeah. a different way of being. And far from that being a threat to anyone, that's, that's, some, that's a voyage of discovery for everyone because it enriches all our lives. To find out an, about another culture, especially one as wonderful as China's, is a way, is a form of education an enlightenment for us all. It's a broadening of the mind. But in terms of Hong Kong's sense of Chineseness, I think it's inevitably a slow process, or let's call mm. it a slow burn. You know, that, mm. it, that this kind of thing doesn't happen uh, overnight. Uh, but, but if people have the chance to find out, then that's a very good beginning, isn't it? Yeah. You know, um... There's no quick solution to anything. If there's quick solution, the results usually in the long term will not be satisfying. However, yeah. there is always the first step to do everything, mm. to do everything mm. for the better. So mm. I see all of these important aspirations and uh, inspirations our panelists have been illustrating and emphasizing on during this discussion. Any of those works, one could say, in the Hong Kong Palace Museum is a crystallization of what Chinese history has been like. It would present an aspect of it that, when putting together, would help us to understand what China is. And you know what? It's not just about those cultural relics. It is also about us, the Chinese today, uh, both on the mainland in Hong Kong, in Macau. And those young people, particularly, joining us today as well. Now, we are having a few minutes uh, for you to also pose your questions to our panelists today. Uh, if any one of you have any questions or you want to share your thoughts, raise your hand. I will try to bring you in front of the camera. Wow. 
very active audience we got over there virtually. Huh? So the lady in the very first uh, line in the middle, please. The long-haired lady, yes, please. Yeah, with glasses. Yeah, please. Uh, my name is Yu Feng. I'm from the Institute of American Studies of CAS. Um, my question goes to Professor Han. Mm. So how do you think that um, Hong Kong should better combine the ethnicity of Chinese culture and cultural diversities, and also uh, the local culture of Hong Kong to build a cultural highland. Professor Hong, are you ready for an academic yes. paper? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, Go ahead. Okay. It is a very big question. Um, I, I don't think, you know, I, actually I don't like the word of saying building a cultural highland. There's no such thing as a cultural mm -hmm. highland. Every culture is unique and we should equally respect. Uh, I think, what, but to do what we want to do, which is really has an interchange, is really introducing one to the other. One is obviously through like conferences and displays and museums. Another thing is to create commercial value. Okay, I think that's what Hong Kong is good at. I mean, we have auction houses, obviously with antiques and cultural relics. Uh, we, can, we have other things like movies, Okay, songs, um, and also even like designed uh, and advertisement. Now these are culture, but they're also businesses. And that is what Hong Kong is very good at. And I think Hong Kong being a melting pot of both West and uh, the East uh -huh. uh, has always been very innovative in this particular area. And that's the area I think we should build more. Uh, because only way it creates a lot of economic value then you can actually attract more people to come to Hong Kong to show, to sell, to exchange their culture. Of course, the, through the use of technology as well. I mean, there's a, a quite a few of my friends are in the area of, you know, researching in this area, uh, like immersive art, okay? Uh, like kind of combination of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, AR and, uh, and, and, you know, uh, augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, and there's things like the NFT trade. All these things actually help to create a more robust market um, that also can help us to uh, not only understand, but okay. also spread culture. Great point. Second question. Anyone? Okay, let's give uh, maybe a, the, the fourth line, the fifth frame. So it's me. Okay. Hi. So my name is Nikki, and I'm an entrepreneur in Macau, and my company also operates in Hong Kong and the UK as well. So, like, uh, my question will go to Professor Lam in Macau. The future of Greater Bay Area is that the Silicon Valley of China? If so, like, what is the world of Macau, and how should our generation and our next generation prepare to take to take up the position? Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, question. So I'm happy to see uh, a young entrepreneur uh, from Macau here. I think for Macau, people in Macau, we should also kind of uh, gain our own confidence. I think we have that kind of uh, cultural sensitivities. And so uh, I always think that this is a very good, um, you know, strength for people from Macau. Right. Uh, we understand Hong Kong people quite well, right? Because we watch the TVB and we watch Hong Kong uh, TV program. And we understand uh, mainland uh, Chinese very well as well because we have a uh, kind of close relationship with them. And people in Macau, uh, half of the population were born in China. And so we also have a very frequent contact with them. And at the same time, we understand, okay, of course, uh, Western, or you, call, you can call it the European culture. So I think if we can use all these kind of strategies to connect uh, business or people from the Greater Bay Area and the world. So a lot of ideas and pragmatic ways to get the ideas implemented. We talk about connectivity, we talk about culture, and now it is time to say goodbye. But before that, let me ask our panelists, if I ask you what is going to be the dynamics of connectivity for Hong Kong, how is that going to blossom? What would you say? Let's go with Martin first. Well, it's, uh, this is a great opportunity. Um, Hong Kong will need to reinvent itself to be 
the kind of success I think it could be. Uh, and uh, the next period is going to be challenging and very interesting. <laughs> Norman. It is going to be um, very important for the governments to create a collaborative environment to include the government side, business community, grassroots, and the, can, can the uh, governments in other part of the Greater Bay areas. So to make this successful to the future journeys. Mm. Agnes? I hope Hong Kongers will regain their confidence as the world leading city of China. And Whitman? I think uh, connectivity as a key element, we need to be more comprehensive. Not only are we having infrastructure connectivity, what we also need is connectivity between governments, connectivity between regulators, connectivity on data, on information, on different every aspects we need to connect. Okay. And only then that we, play, we can play this role. Edward, last but not least. Uh, connectivity will require political leadership, certainly from Hong Kong, but also from the rest of the Greater Bay Area. It also requires business leadership, in particular from big businesses who are incumbent in Hong Kong. Uh, big businesses need to open, open up their minds and be willing to go into new areas of businesses that will benefit the bulk, mm -hmm. the bulk of Hong Kong instead of for themselves. That will be the core to connectivity. Thank you so much uh, for the ideas and insights coming from our panelists. Thank you, really appreciate it. And also, we would like to express our appreciation to the participants uh, online who has been watching, participating, as well as discussing with us as well. Thank you. And we are coming to the end of this episode, Dynamics of Connectivity for CGTN's Global Thinkers project focusing on the policy of one country to systems. I'm Tian Wei. Thank you for watching. Bye for now. And all the best. Mm -hmm.